Okay, so up to this point, we've got uh, the two articles. They don't look like articles yet. They just look like a stream of content. That'll be defined later. I want to then talk about putting a sidebar. I want to put on the side extra information, a second column. So we have a tag that can help us for that to make side content. Then at the very end of the document, I want to add the footer an area down at the bottom with perhaps like copyright information. So we have a couple of tags that will allow us to do that. Let's see here then into the code. After section, this is conceptually a different section. We're still, however, in the div. This div is going to be our main, like, the white background, that main area, in front of the stars. So this still has to be a part of div. Line 51, we've gone past the section of the main content. Next we need sidebar content. We have a tag called aside. A-S-I-D-E, aside used for sidebar content. I will make a quick note here for the sidebar. A side for the sidebar. Some of these tags have precedence in uh, publishing. Article makes sense. It's an article in a newspaper or a magazine. Well, in blogs and websites, we have articles, we have content. We have in a newspaper or a magazine a section, a particular page and such. We have section here. If we were in a newspaper or a magazine or something, and a side <coughs> would be content that is related to the article but off to the side, like a pull quote, related content, we have a side. Inside of a side, we're going to have two sections. We'll start the first section first. We have a section that's going to display more links, more articles to read, and then a section of contact information. So inside of the section, this will have a heading, heading 2, uh, for recent posts, recent articles. H2. We can call that recent posts. This is all going to be in the sidebar, in a section of recent posts and then a section of contact information. I'm going to say that under recent posts we have the lists of these other characters that we can click to view their article. These are going to be links, so from the moment I will put links here to eventually link them, a tags to eventually link them, href, and I might not know how many of these articles I'm going to make, so one way to create a link, to make it behave like a link but it actually doesn't go anywhere, is to put the semi, or the hashtag, hash mark, this dummy link right here. It doesn't actually go anywhere, but it behaves like a link. Because I'm going to have a link to an article eventually for the character Venom. I want three more, I want three more articles, three more links. Well, this whole block is what I want three more times. I want <coughs> a tag linking nowhere with a character closing. So if you copy that and paste it three more times below it, that'll save you the effort. So next line, paste, and paste, and paste. I can start off with four. And then just some characters here. So let's say I've got Squirrel Girl, I've got Jean Grey, and Doctor Doom. So eventually these will be linked, venom.html, doom.html, whatever. But that's just a dummy link. It's temporary. It'll behave like a link, but it won't go anywhere. <coughs> it is a section of recent posts. 
Now before I go on, let me mention a couple of things here for speed. Um, if you have typing experience, you definitely have an advantage. There's no way around that. You can type the code faster. If you don't have the typing experience, it's a little bit of a disadvantage, but you can manage. One trick, I'm going to mention several tricks, but one trick that I can mention right now to do things quickly is to get used to selecting things quickly. You might have gone with your mouse, clicked and dragged this piece over here, and whoops, dragged too much. Let me come back. I dragged it properly. Whoops, I dragged too much. Okay, the mouse, we all have experience with it for years and years, but it still can be cumbersome. With coding, you have some shortcuts on the keyboard. If by now you are not using the arrow keys, that's that's slowing you down. On the keyboard, there are arrow keys, and they're not there just to play video games and shoot at you know aliens and such. These arrow keys help you a lot also in navigating your code. Simply pressing left and right moves me left and right across a line. Seems basic. Why does it matter? Well, using the arrow keys plus shift will allow me to select line character by character without the mouse. And maybe the mouse is really nice and I'm used to it, but it can be slow and cumbersome. It can select too much too little. With the arrow keys, again, my, my blinking cursor is right there at the beginning, holding shift, arrow to the right, to start selecting. My hand's already at the keyboard. I'm already typing. It's going to take half a second to go to the mouse and make the selection. But those half seconds add up. And as you type and type and type, those half seconds add up and add up. So, okay, it's still going to take time for me to shift to the right. Well, guess what? There's an end key right above the arrows. Shift, end, selected the whole line, no matter if it's 2,000 characters long. I'm not going to shift right click 2,000 times. I'm at the start of the line. I hold shift, end, selected the whole line to the end. If my arrow, if my cursor, and here think people, I don't know why, no offense, but people don't think outside the box. Don't literally think you always have to go to the beginning shift end. I'm at the end. Why don't I shift home to go back to the beginning? I have an end. I have a home. So if I'm at the end of the line, hold shift, press home, it goes to the beginning of the line, no matter how many thousands of characters long it is. It does take practice if you've gotten a lot of experience with the mouse and now with the keyboard here. It takes practice to remember, oh, I can just shift right, shift home, shift end. My hand is still on the keyboard, control C. Why go to the mouse, right click, copy, move mouse, right click, paste. You have your hands on the keyboard, control C, one hand operation, move down with the arrow, control V, click. Of course, keep doing it with the mouse if you're used to that. But I would highly recommend in practice, especially during lab time, try to navigate, turn that mouse upside down. I can turn the mouse upside down and do everything I need to do without touching the mouse. Arrow keys. I'm jumping to my lines quickly. I need to page up, page down. I have page up, page down. I need to select a line, shift end with one hand, with practice, control C, control V. I'm showing off, yes. But eventually, this saves you a lot of time to be able to do the keyboard and not the mouse. The mouse is perfect for clicking and dragging windows and all of that great stuff, but on text, try to get comfortable with just the keyboard. That's how it looks like I, I can type so so fast and grinding and speed and all of that because I know the shortcuts. Copy and paste with one hand and all of that. So here, back to this. Dr. D. Well, this is a section <coughs> in the sidebar. I want a second section to display contact information. So the after the end of section in the aside, still make sure you're in the aside, the sidebar. We need a new section.
we have a section for recent posts, H2. We need another H2 for contact. Contact information for this blog. If someone wanted to contact the author of the blog, this is the section where it'll have that content. So heading to contact. What I want to put in that section are paragraphs of information. And again, in HTML, a paragraph can be a few sentences, a few words, one character. <coughs> one character, but a P for paragraph is a unit of content, a paragraph. What I'm trying to display in the paragraph in the section of contact is an address who is behind this, uh, this blog, for example. There's a tag that is used to display addresses. So inside that paragraph, address tag. Most browsers will display the address as italicized. If I wanted it styled in a different way, that's CSS. But I have the right tag for the right task. The task for this tag is to display an address. We'll put in some any information here. So we'll fill in, fill in a name, line break, and an address. Line break, and then a, another line. Save and run that. We've created a whole sidebar. It won't look on. It won't be to the side yet. That's CSS. But we're building the content in the aside. A section for recent posts and a section for contact info. So save it and run it. If I run it, again, it's don't expect it to be on the side yet. So what I'll see is recent posts. There's all those links. Hmm, I didn't put breaks. That's OK. We can force breaks via CSS. So we can have breaks either by writing break or via CSS, making each of these its own line. I'm doing it differently here just to show you that it can be broken into multiple lines via CSS as well. Here's other posts, other characters, then a contact, and then the address, and it italicized it here. I've been running it in Firefox this whole time, but if you've been running it in Chrome, it should look about the same. Maybe the size of text is a little different here and there. That's what I have so far. <coughs> All of that is in the aside. I think I saw your hand first, yes. Um, the default for address is italics, then? For most browsers, yes. We can override that later with CSS. Yes? These H1 and H2 are all those, is H1 like the font size open to the H2? Yes. The the, the H's have those characteristics, definitely. H1 is always the biggest one, the biggest heading. And H2 down to 6 are smaller sizes. Visually, they have that, that they are different sizes from smallest to largest. But also conceptually, that's why I hammered home about conceptually, this concept of this group of elements, H2, H3. So I'm ignoring the sizes for it because they're not exactly the design and sizes and colors that I want, which then I can override and fine-tune in CSS. We're seeing here, and we saw last time, that when we write this code, basically the browser starts from the top and processes every line straight down. When it comes to a line, it processes it. So that's why right now everything is just in a straight line. Um, the last bit that I wanted to look at at the very bottom of the page is the footer. 
the very end content. Via CSS, we can break the order of the flow. We can have the footer, if we wanted to, appear first instead of header. We wouldn't really want that because footer should go at the bottom and header should go at the top. But again, the power of CSS, we'll see that soon. Question? What if the fonts and this add the letters? Mm -hmm. What did you do? Nothing. The web browser automatically. The address is supposed to be relevant. Not supposed to be, but that's what the web browser has chosen to do. And we were able to change the style of the address later. Let's see, so section, aside, still in the div, new line, footer. We have a footer tag. All the content that the foot of the document will appear here. This will be pretty simple. This will be um, a paragraph. The paragraph is the most basic unit the most basic bit of structure in HTML. It's often the default. On top of that, we might have a heading to elevate it to a bigger size and statue. Um, we might have the address to give it the meaning that this is further address information. So down at the bottom, it's a paragraph. It's one line. And here I'll put a copyright notice. Copyright. And we have a copyright symbol. I want to get the little C copyright. Ampersand copy semicolon. I can go look up very easily again online HTML character codes, and I'll get the list of the 16,000 of them that I can choose from. The year, and then your name or whatever you want. That will become a symbol we saw on the other site. Just for fun, I'll put in a, I'll throw in a couple more symbols here. Ampersand cent will create the cent symbol. Ampersand yen semicolon. Now remember, these are semicolons. These are all going to create these symbols. Euro. There's a bunch of them. Put some here for you to look at. Cent, yen, euro, hearts, e, acute. Each one is this with an ampersand and a semicolon. No space between the ampersand and the semicolon, but spaces between each element. Save and run that. You'll see your footer. You'll see some symbols down there. I see my result. At the very end, there's the footer. Copyright symbol appears. If it doesn't, make sure you spell it right. And some other symbols. I can search list of character, list of HTML characters. You'll find plenty of sites out there. Complete list of HTML entities. Lots and lots to choose from. If I wanted to do infinity, different ways to display it. Ampersand infin, so I call it or this particular code. Some of them don't have a some of them don't have a name to remember. There is a code for it. Their hearts, yes, spades, clubs, and diamonds as well. Huh, there's one called lozenge. You want to have a lozenge, L O Z. So at this point, this is what we've got structurally, this is the exact same thing as this. 
visually very different. Recent posts, the items there, the contact, the article, read more. There's an effect when you roll over some of these things up here. That's coming up next. And then eventually the mobile-friendly aspect, so that if you're on a mobile device, it looks good on a mobile device. That's looking similar to what we had just in basic design, but still with effects. So let's pause here. Everything should be like this. Anyone need a little help to make sure you're at this point? CSS is coming up. <laughs> Okay, so CSS is all about styling it, setting the design, the look of it, the alignment, all of those things that we played with previously. One thing I want to start to do is start with a background color and set a little bit of styling with text and different things. So we're going to write embedded CSS, meaning at the top of our document in the head, we're going to write our CSS code. I'm going to make a note that at the moment we have 75 <coughs> lines of HTML. We're probably going to have like 175 lines of CSS um, to style our elements. That's very common. The actual HTML content could be relatively small, the CSS then is larger than that, perhaps double or more, and then the JavaScript could be triple the code of the others. It's uh, very common because it's more complex. Those languages then are more complex than the HTML. Let's create a style block in the head block at the top of the document. This is for CSS. We saw last time that when we wanted to make changes to body, for example, we wrote style and added a uh, property and it changed it, or to the H1. But we touched on that instead what we could do is with one central location target the various tags. So let's start off that way. We're going to target the body tag. No angle brackets here. We don't put angle brackets here because this is not HTML code anymore. It's CSS code. So body, space, curly brace, enter a couple of times. Previously, we had the curly braces on one line. Here, we're going to start breaking them into multiple lines because we're going to have multiple lines of CSS code. That's a lot easier to read than one line, one long line that goes off the edge of the screen. Again, make sure these are curly braces. They're right next to the, to the letter P on the keyboard. So here we're saying, wherever there's a body tag, and we only should have one, let's change it, let's affect it in different ways. That's what CSS is about. Targeting elements and then changing them. Inside of the curly braces here they were, is where I'll write my various properties and values, the exact ways I'm going to change it. One way to start off is let's set a background color. Let's do light slate gray. In CSS, it's all one word. Save it and run it. Your design should then change over to the background color, should change over to light slate gray. If you didn't, let's pause there because this we're going to build and build and build on top of this. So if it's not working at this point, call me over. But it should look like this. There, here it is without any styling yet, and here it is starting to style it. So you should get a light slate gray.
let's uh, change our color of text color. We'll do dim gray. We can put a color formula in all of that is if we want it. We'll do that later. But here's a couple of colors um, that I want to use. And before we go check the result, let's add something else. Font dash family. We can set the font, the style of the letters. Let's type one called Chiller, in this case capital C. The why and when to use it all, we get we'll get it'll make more sense as we do it in short more than one word in CSS, dash, if it's a property. If it's a value, no dashes. Font family, I'm choosing a font. Here's the name of the font, capital letter. Save it and run it. Make sure you've got a colon between the property and the value, colon. And make sure you've got a semicolon at the end of each line. Save it and run it, and everything should then become very scary looking. This is the chiller font. Some of this text uh, looks better than others. You know, the smaller text is a little harder to read, the bigger text is a little easier to read. I just wanted to choose an obvious font to show that we can change the size of the, the style of the font. I'm not really going to use that one, but font family is the property to uh, to be affected, and the chiller is the actual value. I'm going to make a comment up here. In, H in CSS, the comment has to be this way. Make sure you've got slash, asterisk, asterisk, slash. That's a comment. CSS properties and values. So what's on the right of the colon is the value. What's on the left is the property. Up here, a CSS selector. Body. I'm selecting the body tag. And then I'm changing the properties and the values of that element. I want a, a font family that is um, a little bit more sedate, uh, more readable. Uh, a font like Chiller looks nice if it's a nice big headline and such, uh, but we'll, we'll keep it a little bit more basic. Uh, we're going to say here, Georgia. The problem when we had chosen Chiller was it depended if that font was on the person's computer if it would show up or not. Chiller font is not common on a Mac. We've all got Windows computers here, so we all saw Chiller, if we spelled it right. But if someone visited our site on a Mac, they don't have Chiller installed on their computer, so it won't show up. What we can do is we can specify uh, a series of fonts. Try this font. If that one doesn't work, try this font. If this one doesn't work, try that one simply by putting a comma. We're going to say, try the Georgia font first, comma. If that one doesn't work, try times, comma. Fonts that have one word, you can simply write them, but fonts that have multiple words should be in quotes. Times New Roman. If someone visits our site, let's try to use the Georgia fonts. If they don't have it, try Times. If they don't have it, try Times New Roman. And then, comma, if all else fails, I don't want to list 20 fonts, but if all else fails, then we will try a generic font called Serif. The computer or the web browser or the, the device will then choose a generic Serif font. 
Serif fonts are in the family and the style of Times New Roman. You probably know how that one looks. It's the basic font that um, that that we that we look at on most sites. If I run that, the color changes. The font changes a bit. So I'm gonna chiller was just temporary. Let me show you here before and after. This is before I had specified my font. Some font was chosen. After I specify my font, it changed a bit. The color changed, but look at look at the the spacing of it and the and the styling of it. For example, look at the H there. This mystery font, the top of the H is at the top of the T. But when I had chosen these new set of fonts, the H goes above it. It's just a different font. It's a different style. If the person had the particular font, it would look nice. If they don't, we have the fallbacks. And later on, we will see another way to specify fonts is a font online. If there's a font online, we can reference that font, and it doesn't matter that the person has it on their computer. They can get the version online. That's more complex. We'll get to it a little later. But if none of those fonts work, then it says just choose a generic serif font. I want to alter the default size of my fonts. Next line, font-size. Let's try, let's try type 12px. Save it and run it. Twelve pixels, twelve dots. That looks like a certain size. We can do you know nineteen pixels. That's a different size. See how it got larger. If you were using Microsoft Word and we wanted to set the size of a font, what units do they use there? points. The default is points. 12 point font, 14 point font. So you can do the units of points, PT. They're similar to pixels. There's points. Another unit is percentage, 100%. This is going to set the font size of all of the text in the body to a standard 100%. We have some, I'm going to make a note, some units here. Pixels. Points. Percentage. And M, M's. Try instead to M. No space between the units. To M. The first two that I listed here are, are, are rigid units. The next two are elastic units. Two or 20 pixels may look really nice on this nice big monitor. But 20 pixels may be too big on this little monitor. So if I put seven pixels for this little monitor, seven pixels might be too small for this monitor. So these first two are rigid. They are fixed. They're, they're not the best for all purposes, because eventually this project will show up in a small device, in a large device. So we have instead percentages and M's, which are flexible. Those are the ones that are more recommended to use. Percentage makes sense. 100% is a standard size. If I wanted the size twice as big, what would that be? 
200%. If I wanted it, you know, three quarters of a percent of normal, what would that be? 75%. Well, M's are similar to that in that they are flexible. So if I run that, 2M, huge. 2M, it's big. But 2M on that monitor looks big, and 2M on this will look big, but proportionally big. So these two units are the preferred ones, percent or Ms. And the M comes from the letter M of the font. So in the Georgia font, it, it has a letter M of a default size. We're saying make our font sizes two of those Ms from that font. The Chiller font has a letter M of a different size. So based on the Chiller font, two Ms size. Usually I'm going to be using Ms for these units because they're flexible. I want the flexibility when I go to mobile devices. I don't want the rigidity of pi pixels or points. I want a standard size 1M. That's the same as 100%. Basically 100% is 1M. Basically 200% is 2M. If I want to do 150%, I just write 150%. How do you think you write that in M's? 1.5. So if I wanted a font one and a half times the normal size of the letter M of the font, 1.5M. It's very common to see M's when you make mobile projects, or responsive projects, or adaptable projects. 1M, normal sized. I'm seeing perhaps some of the text between some of the lines is a little too close, maybe, where I've got that text and the read more text. Maybe I could uh, open up that line height between them, the space between them. We have a CSS rule for that. Now the thing about CSS, like HTML, is there's like 200 tags. We've learned like you know 12 HTML tags, and we're going to learn you know 20 CSS tags. There's hundreds of them, literally. We don't need to know every single tag. It's nice to know every single one and show it off to people, but you don't, you're not going to use a lot of these tags all the time. And when I need to know the right tag for the right task, I can look it up. I personally don't have every tag memorized. I don't need it. I look up the tag when I need it, and I use it, and then I memorize it for that moment. But I'm not, I might not need a tag every single time. So there's a tag that we have in order to increase the, the, the line height, the space between this line and that height. Line height. I'm going to say 1 1⁄2m. Don't have the space between lines so tight of 1m, have it 1 and a half m. A little bit more space between for readability. Line dash height. So it's subtle, but you see here, before and after. Before the space is a little close, after it's a little more spaced out and readable. The order of this code does matter. Um, because we could further write later on, again, you don't have to write this, background color red. We've just defined background color twice. The second one was last, the second one took over. So, I want to say, okay, the dim gray background is okay, it's nice, but I would rather have a graphic back there. 
uh, I'm going to instead, we're going to instead put a, a background image. But the reason we wrote it in this way is, let's start with a basic color first. And if the picture, for whatever reason, is corrupted or doesn't load up, it at least will have a background color. So we'll have background dash image. URL, open, close, parentheses. So basic color first, and then let's try to load a picture. If that picture doesn't load, at least we have a color. To display a picture, we have to do it this way. We have a colon, we have then this syntax URL. We need to put an address of a picture here. This is different than when we had image. We had image source equals a picture. Here we have URL, parentheses, and then also in quotes, a link to a picture. And I've got a picture of some stars we can use. HTTPS colon slash slash vmcink dot files dot wordpress dot com slash 2017 slash 01 slash galaxy dot jpg. HTTPS colon slash slash vmcink dot files dot wordpress com/2017/01/galaxy.jpg. All of that is in quotes. Part of the URL value. Sometimes a value can be very simple. Background color value is like slate gray. Image. A background image value is URL blah blah blah. Properties and values. Does the comma work? Because I'm trying to picture the red here. There is a way to do it with commas, and we will see a little bit later. So we can try this, then comma, this, then this. But for the moment, I've got them separate. Let's save and run that. If this worked, if you typed it properly, and if the server didn't crash, you should see a uh, star field. Let's see. There we go. So you should see stars, a galaxy. If it didn't work, check this path. Right now, the, the picture, if you notice, when you scroll down, the picture also scrolls. For aesthetics, we can have the picture stuck in one spot while you scroll the content on top of it. That's what I've got in the example. If you noticed, when I scroll, only the main content scrolls and not the background. We can fix that picture to the background. Ours, at the moment, when you scroll, the picture also scrolls away. That's not bad or anything. I'm just saying I would like instead the picture to be fixed and stuck there where my text then scrolls and anything on top of it. So another property and value. To the body, we're changing all of these properties. The background color property originally of body is white. We said light slate gray. Then we said let's change its background image, which was set to nothing. We're setting it to something. And now with a background image, we can then do background attachment, background dash attachment, colon, and its value will be fixed. There's different, there's a default value, I think it's scroll. The background attachment default value is scroll. The image will scroll along with the text, but I've overridden it and now said background attachment is fixed. Save it and run it. You should see that your galaxy doesn't scroll away anymore. It stays fixed while the text on top of it scrolls. Now when I scroll, background stays. Question. 
background attachment, here's what it does, the difference. When I scroll, the galaxy doesn't scroll. A moment ago, when I scrolled, the galaxy also scrolled. So that's what attachment does. It fixes it into place. All right, so at this point, I've started to style this a little bit more interestingly. The, um, the thing with CSS is that we're going to build on top of things. And style-wise, we have a lot of defaults built in. There's a little bit of space between the edge of the text and the browser. There's some inherent built-in space up here and over here. Um, there's some defaults. CSS, a, a part of it is changing the defaults, and part of it is adding new things that are not a default. There's a default already of some space around the edges. I want to cancel that out so I can write my own styling. I'm in still inside the body selector. We will now add the margin property, just for fun, put in 500px, save it and run it. That'll put 500 pixels of margin of space all around the four edges of the design. Margin of 500, I just chose a very big obvious number to see it so big that it all pushed it way over there. Oh, look at that. So there's 500 pixels to the top on all four edges of this design. Let's try this instead. Let's put 100 px space 5 px space 200 px space um, 300 px, semicolon. This time I've given four values to one property. No commas here. Sometimes things, yeah, you just have to memorize when not. Yes, commas on all of those. I'll explain why no commas here in a moment. Margin. I put in some values. Save it and run it. You'll see a completely different design, different spaces on the tops and rights and all of that. Well, when I had specified one value, it had put that value on all four sides of the screen. Here, I've specified each side, clockwise, starting from the top. So this is top, right, bottom, left. 100 pixels at the top of the screen, 5 at the right, 2 at the 200 at the bottom, 300 at the left, in that order, always. The four sides of the imaginary box around of everything. Everything in HTML has an imaginary box. A box has four sides. So the whole body itself has four sides. The H1 has four sides. The image has four sides. Our link has four sides. A paragraph, everything in HTML has four sides and those sides are invisible until we start to alter it with a background color, with a border, with margins and paddings and other things. Exactly. Clockwise starting from the top. So the right, down, left, back to the top. So if I see that result there's 100 at the top, very little at the right, 200 at the bottom, 300 at the left. Next line, comment margin 100px, 300px. Another comment, top, 
bottom, right, left. If I specify four values, that means I'm specifying the four sides of the box. If I specify two values, the first value is equally the top and the bottom space. The second value is equally the right and the left. I commented all of this just as a comment. It's not going to actually run it. It's a comment. Another comment. Margin 100 px. All four sides at once. So one value will apply it to all four sides. That's the first thing we saw with 500. Two is top, bottom, left, right. Four is all four sides. You can do three, but it's not recommended because then it could get weird. Uh, it assumes it's either one, mm -hmm. two, or four, or three. It could be top right, bottom right, but then it doesn't specify one, so you should avoid three. After all that's said and done, I want to go back now and comment out the one I had there originally. The reason I did it this way instead of just one comment all the way to the end is I may want to use this one in the future, so if I tick off the comment here and here, that's still commented there. If I had done an ending comment there and a starting comment here and I deleted this one, well then I'd have some gibberish that is not code. So I've got opening and closing comment and then another comment. What I'm trying to do here is to build onto it later, I'll set the margin again with this to zero. No units. Zero is zero. We don't have to specify pixels, m's, percent, or anything. It's zero. No margin. I want to cancel out the built-in margin because I want to rewrite it a little later. Checking that. This is bumped all the way to the left. There's zero. This doesn't go further to the left because it's inside of a figure that has some properties that don't allow it to go all the way to the left. That's fine. All of this other stuff is to the left, the footer, everything. At the very top, at the very bottom, that's also pretty much zero. But at the very top, there is still some space, even though I said zero. Well, this is the, this is the puzzle that CSS is. One thing interlocks with another thing. So we've said to the body, cancel out my margins. But what's the very first thing in the main body? Heading 1. Uh, inside of heading. So all of that has some in inherent design. There's a heading 1 inside of a header inside of a div. So that's other built-in sizing and margins and all of that that we'll deal with later. So all of that for our body, we're setting some basic properties, font sizes and colors and backgrounds and that sort of thing. Then we specify deeper. Well, it makes sense also here. There's body, so what I've specified applies to everything. Next after that, we've got a div. And this div, the, pr the purpose of this div is to have content that is separate from the body. The body has the background graphic. I want body to be separate. Well, div here, if we were to write, don't write this yet, but if we were to write div, that would be then the ability for us to then start writing code to change the div. Div, however, is a generic element, and we can have more than one div in our project. We, we just have one, but we could have other divs throughout the project. So we actually should name this div more specifically so that we can further target it via CSS. We're going to say there's a div on the screen so after the curly brace here's a new selector. We'll say dot wrapper not wrapper like music but wrapper like wrapping paper. 
This is another CSS selector. This, however, a class CSS selector. Backing up to body, technically, a tag CSS selector. There is a tag that exists, and I'm selecting it. I'm about to do a wrapper class selector. Background color white. Here I'm saying to the div, set its background white to set it apart from the body. It doesn't know yet, however, that I mean that this wrapper specifies that div. <coughs> we need to add the attribute of wrapper to this div so that they're linked. Let's go back to line 27 or so where you've got your div in the body space to add an attribute of class. That is a class. It's a class because it has a dot at the beginning. A tag doesn't have a dot. A tag is just the name of the tag. I want to attach wrapper to that div as a class. Class equals wrapper. No dot. In the CSS block, the dot means class equals. In the div, class equals means class. No dot. That's just the way this is set up. When, this, when CSS was invented in 1996 or so, this is the way they set it up. I'll further explain what a class is in a moment, but save it and run it. Yes? Yes. When we ever, whenever we make a class, we just, make a, we just add a dot. Yes. Let's look at this. I saved it and I ran it white background, and then behind that div is, the, is still the stars. Down at the bottom, there's still the stars. So the body has the galaxy right here, and then inside of the body is a div, a division, and that has a class of wrapper, which we then said background color white. There's a CSS selector. some notes, lots of notes in here, so I broke it into multiple lines. Um, classes used to target an element in CSS. Classes may be reused multiple times per document. Classes have a dot or a period full stop, uh, have a dot in style, classes are quote-unquote attached to HTML via class equals x. This div has been more uniquely identified. This is the whole purpose of this. I could have written div background color white, and it would work in this case. But div is too generic. I can use divs many times. Every div would become white, and I want one div to be yellow, one div to be white, one div to be purple. So if I name this div a little more uniquely, wrapper, I can then further target that one div. The reason why I'm saying here multiple times that will contrast with IDs a little later. There's classes and IDs, but for the moment, tags and classes. When you write this comment, make sure open it and close it, or you'll suddenly deactivate your property here.
width, 960 pixels. This div at the moment takes up all of the width where it sits. We're now altering that. We're saying 960. In this case, I'm putting a fixed value because later on we will put elastic values. Save it and run it. You should see that that background color no longer extends all the way to the edge. It only goes 960 pixels. But now it's not centered anymore. I would like it to be centered. 960 pixels. The background color is there. The design is lo no longer centered. Margin auto. We had margin of 0. We had margin of 50. We had margin of x. If we know a value or an approximate value, we can type it. When you've got a, uh, a printout, and you're going to center something. It's exactly halfway around along the page. You know, there's, let's say, three inches here and three inches here. So with CSS, I can write margin on the left, three inches, and margin on the right, three inches. Then it's centered. If I go landscape, well, now I need four inches and four inches. So uh, margin four, margin four, and it's in the center. I don't know exactly how big or small my screen will be. So one trick to get that to automatically choose an amount of space left and right is auto. And what that does is it automatically puts to the left and to the right whatever space necessary. There it is without it, there it is with it. And as I resize my screen to, to different values, it won't work perfectly yet, but as I resize it to different values, it will continue to have an equal amount. Whatever number of pixels here and here, whatever number here and here are the same. Margin auto. Technically, an automatic amount of space at the top, bottom, the top, right, bottom, left, all four sides. I actually want 1m space auto. I want 1m, one unit of space, on the top and the bottom, space, and then automatic on left and right. Remember, two values mean top and bottom, and then right and left. So that will put 1m of space at the top and the bottom of the design, and then automatic left and right whatever is necessary, landscape, portrait, big, small screen. At a certain point, it goes off the edge of your screen. Yes, we haven't done that part yet. But here I'm starting to say we've got this div, this wrapper, <coughs> floating on top of the background. To further separate it, and for some style, we can do border. We can put a border around that wrapper, that div. The div automatically doesn't have any style. It's basically an invisible box. With a background color, we see the div. And now with a border, we can put an edge on it. Let's start with two pixels, space, a solid line, space, and then some color, red, let's say. This time the property is border, the value is the size of the line, the style of the line, the color of the line. We can, of course, look up CSS border values and get the list of all possibilities. We can look in the books that I've mentioned. I forgot to bring them in today. But those books that are in the syllabus, everything that I'm doing is coming from the books there. And I would like to go through those books chapter by chapter, but that's not quite the class for this. We're going to take a lot of these concepts from those books and apply them to goals. So I would recommend look at those books, get the, get the real version, get the Kindle version, check those books. If you want the full details of all of this that we're looking at, I chose those books because they're a very good sequence of instructions to learn every aspect. Those books are, you know, 500 pages to learn everything about the code. 
solid red line around it. We have dashed. That'll put a little dashed line around it. Put it in the comments here. Do solid dashed. I think there's one called double. There's one called dotted. I think there's one called ridge. If one doesn't work, it'll ignore it. And again, I, I can go look it up. We can go look it up. These are some that should work. We'll put a dash, it'll put a dash line around it. This unit right here, we can do ands or whatever. Commonly, it's just pixels. 2 pixels, 10 pixels, 1 pixel, 99 pixels. The color red, the color yellow, yellow azure, a hexadecimal number, an RGB number. But for fun, I can do double. Double, what's it called? Um, no, dotted. Here's dotted. I think double works, but it's too small. I think if you do five. Yeah, there it is. So if you do double, it was too small. I put five. Now you see a double edge. And red is too obvious, so just uh, black. If it works at this point, great. Let's take a break. And if it doesn't, call me over. It's 8.33. We'll be back at 8.43. This is what it should look like so far. You've got your div separate from your background. Yes, this text is still bumping up to the left. We'll fix that. We've got some sort of line, and uh, we're on our way.